Hello, welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, send questions and comments to our Twitter page at Mason Roundtable or on the Facebook event page for episode 184, Daylight Lodges. Me, John Ruart. I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia. Next up, Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson here, uh, past master of Waukegan Lodge number 78, Waukegan, Illinois, current sitting secretary. Thanks. Hi, Robert. Mike, the intern. Hey, Mike Hamburg here, Village Lodge, number 274 in Burton, Ohio, current junior steward and lodge education officer. All right. Welcome back, Mike. Next up, Juan Sepulveda. From sunny Kissimmee, Florida, Juan Sepulveda at your service, member of Orange Blossom Lodge, number 80, and the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast, episodes pending this week. Cool, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And last but not least, Jason Michael Richards. Hey, everybody. Jason Richards here from Acacia Lodge number 16, where I'm the Worshipful Master for like two more paltry months, which is amazing. And also member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in the District of Columbia. Great. So we have a full house tonight. Cheers to all. And let's get to Masonic News. First up, we have an article on none other than Chris Hodap's blog, sharing of brothers, of obligations, and of sacrifice. Uh, now, there's a little bit, this is really a follow-up article uh, to something that came out, I don't know what would you say, about six months ago or so. And uh, there was an appeal to the entire community, but to Masonry in general, to help a brother out. Mike, will you elaborate on this story for us, please? Sure. Um, yeah, back in uh, about six months ago, uh, brother Chris Stevenson uh, was looking, he's uh, suffering from juvenile diabetes and he needed a kidney. So he posted um, and it got posted on ODAP's site. And a brother named Richard Veer of Utah uh, saw this and decided that uh, he would see if he could uh, help out. Um, and just uh, this last weekend, he uh, went to DC, went in for surgery, and had one of his kidneys uh, transplanted to Chris. Um, and uh, Hodap's uh, site didn't uh, post this until after uh, they were both out of surgery. Um, and let's see. Yeah, he's uh, Richard is 32. He's from Ogden, Utah. He's a junior deacon of Golden Spike Lodge, number six. Uh, he's the father of two. Uh, he contacted Chris and, uh, uh, you know, volunteered to uh, see if he could help out. So I, I think that's a great thing. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a really, uh, in some ways, what we're all about. I mean, helping one another out. Um, it's part of our, you know, part of our obligation and oath to help out Brother Masons. And I think this is a great example of that. Yeah, Chris is actually a, a member of my lodge, uh, the Colonial Lodge, number 1821. So uh, I met him only once, but, uh, you know, he, he seemed like a, a really nice guy. Um, and I'm really, really thankful that uh, he was able to get at least at this point, the the help that he needed, of course, we'll we'll have to see, and, and hopefully, uh, Mark Wright from DC will will keep us up to date on on Facebook on how they're actually doing, and hopefully, the the organ will take. Um, but we we wish both those brothers just all the best, and I think it's 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 a wonderful, refreshing look at at Masonic sacrifice and and what this brotherhood can can bring and, and what it can actually offer to uh to to brethren across the united states as far as that the camaraderie that just really can't be found anywhere else all right so the big question is 
would you donate your kidney for a brother that you never met? If someone said today, oh, we need to make a decision. Are you ready to go? Go today. Would you do it? I would most certainly do it, yes. I'd do it. Nope. I'm a Robert. Oh, so I got to be a tiebreaker, huh? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, are you going to get, I mean, so it depends on your uh, Scottish right jurisdiction. So <laughs> if you're northern, you're northern. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, of course, northern. So, yeah. Yeah. Just going to ask those clarifiers. Um, <laughs> you're also a jester. Um, <laughs> let's... No. So, I mean, I guess I should say the reason I'm, I wouldn't do that is uh, because... Look, I'm 35, and I got kids, and you know they come first, all the way up until the time that you know my my vital organs wouldn't be needed by them. I think uh, so. That that's kind of where I stand on it. But you know, if I was a single guy, had nothing going on, I was a match. I mean, why wouldn't you help if you could? You know, if you had. No other plans for your insights. <laughs> yeah. it, it, let, me, let me put it this way, just a visual. You're eating an ice cream cone, and I walk up to you. You notice my ring. I greet you as a brother. I say, hey, can I lick the other side of that cone? I say, whoa, no, 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 wait a second. <laughs> get your own over, and I'm done with this one. <laughs> you can get one. No, I, my my initial thought was the same as yours. It's like I have kids, and you know, God forbid, one of my children needed it, uh, or one of my immediate family members. It's a very complex complex issue. Um, I do strongly believe that if you can, you should be an organ donor. So, I've that's one thing that I've that I've made sure that I have on my on my list of things. So, my I don't know how it works in your state, but my license says it, organ donor. So, I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, I know my family's been impacted by organ donation in a good way, right? Um, I uh, got many more years out of my, my father who's still living uh, due to an organ donation. And so, uh, I'm all for organ donation, right, as far as... Um, after you kick the bucket, take as much as you need from me, right? Um, but uh, until then, I'm um, in the, the Robert and uh, Juan camp as far as the expected value, right? I'm looking at opportunity cost. I'm looking at, you know, long-term uh, impacts of that. So, you know, take it after I don't need them, but I got what I got for now. <clears throat> well, and I mean, you know, when it, when it comes to obligations, again, you know, there's a lot of talk of making sure that in your charity and benevolence to your brethren, you don't injure yourself or your family as well. Um, so there is there is something to be said about that. Remember your oats. Boom. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, if we examine our obligation, um, it does become apparent that there is a triage there. Uh, so... Cool. Good. I, yeah, a, I'd, I I would I mean to be honest, I'd I'd have a hard time, you know, making that decision. Oh, absolutely. Uh, oh, but I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad it uh worked out and hopefully uh everybody's recovering well. And uh is there a way, Jason, maybe next week you can give us an update <clears throat> on where we are? Yeah. With that. Great. <clears throat> okay, uh let's see. Next up is an article out of Canada. So let me <clears throat> um, screen share this. And we have out of Canada <clears throat> a beautiful friendship, how a group of Freemasons are giving back to the local beavers. It's no wonder that the Freemasons are supportive of the Wolfville beavers. Uh, the beavers have been provided a meeting space at the Masonic Lodge for three years of no charge. And I think it's it's fascinating, this this sense of involvement and um, direct interpersonal relationship between the Freemasons and the Beavers over the years that um, apparently it looks like in the article, the Freemasons presented the Beavers with a custom badge that's a recognition and a tribute 
uh, of the Freemason support and mentoring of the Beavers. So as um, it, the article goes on to talk about <clears throat> how the recent badge presentation was a celebration of the resurrection of the first Beavers. I think they're really celebrating how the, the, the Beavers kind of came back from not being that active. In fact, um, they quote, they said just, they restarted three years ago. They only had six Beavers and now they're up to 20 Beavers. Uh, so I think that's that's really great to see how how much um, how many new beavers they've got in this this community uh, due to the involvement of the Freemasons. So uh, every spring, <clears throat> the beavers like to visit a meeting of the Freemasons to say thank you for the continued support. Uh, so I think that's a that's a feel good article about how the um, local Freemasons are giving back to the beavers. And it's, you know, it's, it's always awesome to see, again, you know, <clears throat> charity and community outreach as a natural extension of, you know, men, you know, making good men better. And, um, you know, this is a new organization. I, uh, I haven't heard of the Masons working with um, the Beavers before. So this, this must be uh, more of a Canada uh, centric thing, but again yeah this is this is just a, a great you know feel good article and, and masonry needs i think more more feel good um shows of of goodwill um to be honest because there's there's a lot of bad press uh that's just hitting us every single day whether it's conspiracy theorists uh blaming everything on the masons or uh you know we've got uh you know lodge arsons and uh you know all sorts of uh, you know all sorts of bad press and uh you know when you when you can get the the masons together with with groups like the beavers i think everybody just has a good time and it's just a a great way to showcase the good that that masons do with organizations like the girl scouts the boy scouts or, or even the beavers it's yep. great you, you mentioned that the I think when you have a, an organization like scouting where, you know, we're so in, in America, scouting is so much tied to tied to masonry in a lot of areas. And one could say that scouting, you know, gets uh, a man on the path to becoming a better man. And it's continued into that journey in Freemasonry. And so maybe in Canada, uh, the beavers make good men better also eventually coming into Freemasonry. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a great thing. I, you know, it, it's got to help out a lot, you know, um, you know, uh, especially, you know, I mean, uh, these organizations like that, I mean, the scout, I mean, all forms of scouting, um, you know, uh, it just, I mean, I don't, I don't see where this could go wrong for them. So I think it's a great thing. I love the idea that we're, you know, getting out there with positive uh, notes. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, let's uh, transition into this week's topic, which is Daylight Lodges. Uh, this is a listener request. I wanted to have more background information about Daylight Lodges. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about the cross-jurisdictional differences, how the... <clears throat> Um, how many, if you know how many Daylight Lodges are in, in your jurisdiction, kind of where they got started, how new they are, what they do when they meet, that kind of stuff. Um, but I think it's first and foremost, I'll hand it over to Mike, the intern, to um, talk about the history of Daylight Lodges as, as he's found in his research. Uh, so I will hand it off to you, Mike, the intern. Okay. So um, I found a website out there about it's actually about daylight lodge number 232 but their site actually talks about the history and that you know uh, one of the things that pretty much says is the practice of a lodge meeting during daytime hours is not as unique as it may seem uh, for Masonic historians suggest that uh, operative lodges were generally held Saturdays during daylight hours when wages were paid 
the apprentices were also examined then and general matters discussed, after which they no doubt required a festive, repaired to a festive board um, for the, you know, the day's repast. Um, but, you know, it, uh, what their site kind of tends to do is just cover through a lot of, I mean, a lot of this different states and when they had it. Um, and I found this simply just because it showed up on a search for Ohio, that Ohio's first um, Daylight Masonic Lodge was uh, in 1911. Um, they, uh, uh, it was, it's called uh, Meridian, um, number uh, 610. And they, uh, let's see. So over uh, 100 years ago. What's that? So over 100 years ago. Yeah, over 100 years ago. Uh, Ohio had its first daytime lodge in 1911. It was born in a print shop where the presses rumbled and the odor of ink and lead uh, zinc printing plate pervaded the atmosphere. The idea of providing night workers at the old Cleveland Leader, a morning paper, was the cause for the founding of Meridian Lodge. Um, basically, you know, the guys worked all night, and so... They needed a lodge to be able because most lodges were meeting at night, and this was a way for them to do it. Was they met right there? Um, it uh, also shows that uh, Dayton also had one shortly thereafter, and then uh, in 1915 um, they started work trying to get uh, another lodge. It was called the High Noon Lodge, which actually met at High Noon. That was its uh, focal point. And that lodge, I believe, went on until 1980 when it uh, uh, ceased operations due to low membership. But uh, Meridian uh, Lodge is still functioning. Uh, they've moved all over the place. They used to actually meet at uh, 3615 Euclid Avenue, which is where the uh, Scottish Rite Temple is in uh, the Valley of Cleveland. Um, eventually moving from there to Berea, Ohio, where they currently uh, meet uh, the second Tuesday of, uh, second and fourth Tuesday of every month at uh, 1030. So that's the only one actually in my Google search that I could find that is still doing daylight lodges. That's not to say that it's the only one in Ohio. It's the only one I could find. So. Uh, so for those who are, are kind of new to masonry or, or new to the, the, operation of various lodges. I did share on the Facebook page, and we'll get that on the uh, show notes as well, a complete list of lodges in Virginia. And uh, it's the first time I've seen it <clears throat> generated from uh, our Grand Lodge that actually lists not only all the lodges, but specifically what time they meet all in one table. So you can <clears throat> very quickly, um, <clears throat> I wasn't able to put it in a pivot table yet, Robert, but it, it will be. And uh, to be able to sort through... It's a PDF. Right. Um, oh, no. The... Um, the times that they meet. And so you can just very quickly see all the lodges that meet in the morning. And, um, but m more importantly, how the vast majority of the 300 some odd, 330 some odd lodges we have in Virginia meet at seven o'clock or seven 30 at night. Um, and it's just kind of like, why do we do that? Is it because it's always been done that way? Um, one of my uh, articles that I've been researching for this episode as well so we really don't have a lot of evidence um, of when kind of like the formation of, you know, the of masonry in the 1700s um, when they actually meet as far as like daytime, right? Daytime lodges. So they were mostly evening things, right? Because mostly um, it was a working class thing that everyone had had day jobs as well. Uh, so. Let me go into detail quickly on what I found in Virginia by looking at a complete list of lodges in Virginia, the, the numbers, because I like numbers. <clears throat> we found, I found eight, uh, 15 lodges that either met in the morning or at noon, right? So there was one that met at noon, the rest of the, the other 14 met in the a.m. But if you filtered that down and looked of those 15, um, what day of the week they met, about half, eight of them actually met on a Saturday. So those include a lot of your research lodges, right? So that makes that makes a little bit of sense. <clears throat> um, there were many you know, regular lodges that met on Saturdays, but in the evenings. So they were, I guess, technically they're still an evening lodge. But this is where we start to mix up 
the dichotomy of is it a daylight lodge vice a lodge that meets during the day um and of those 15 three of them actually have daylight in their formal name so we know for the sure those were lodges set aside just to do uh weekday daylight operations uh so that leads me to jason richards for his theory point of interrogation where, where you want to go with this so you know when you look at the data buzzword um when it comes to you know daylight lodges or lodges that meet during the daytime you know it kind of falls into two categories i i think you've got uh, lodges that meet on the daytime during the weekends and then lodges that meet on the daytimes during the weekdays. And I think they really serve two different purposes. Um, when you um, look at the lodges that meet on the weekends, um, I've seen a lot of research lodges, especially in Virginia, meet on the weekends. You've got A. Douglas Smith Jr. Lodge of Research. You've got the Civil War Lodge of Research. They They both meet on the weekends during the day. Uh, the Colonial Lodge number 1821 and Academic Lodge meets on the weekends during the day. And those lodges really cater to um, those, those Masons who are very, very busy during the week, who are active, who are uh, full-time employed, et cetera. Uh, whereas if you look at daylight lodges that meet during the week, like the Fort Hunt Skidmore Daylight Lodge that meets on Wednesday mornings, um, and, and other lodges that meet actually, you know, during the day, during the week, I think you're going to find a, a very, that they're catering to a very different clientele. And th those clientele uh, are primarily Masons who are retired and uh, Masons who may be working um, rotating shifts or, or odd shifts, um, et cetera. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to take a look. And, and my theory is that, uh, that daylight lodges really are are put in place so that masons who can't normally attend lodge in the evenings uh, have the opportunity to uh, to do so. Great, that, that's that's interesting. Um, so let's go to some of the other jurisdictions. Juan, what have you found about daylight lodges in Florida? Yes, I wanted to give a a, a specific example because here in Castleberry, a city in Central Florida, a little bit north of uh, Orlando. When I was very young in masonry, I started hearing that they had an accident in their in their lodge. And I was looking, trying to find a news article about it because it was either a flood or a fire, and they lost their lodge. And a lot of the lodges got together, and with the they they, they basically bailed a brand new lodge for South Seminole Lodge number 364. And shortly thereafter, uh, a petition started rolling around for a daylight lodge. And I remember very clearly the, the purpose for this one in particular was because in, the, in that area, there were a lot of brothers who were not able to drive at night for various conditions. So whether it was because of their eyesight or because they had to... Uh, go to sleep very early it wasn't feasible for them to attend lodge regularly in the regular state of communications that south seminole had so what they did they put the petition to to start a new lodge that would meet in the same building and that became uh hiram's daylight lodge number 407 and the when you go to the to their page the description confirms this, and they also uh, express that it is also for those people who have uh, rotating shift, like Jason mentioned. So they would have an opportunity, people that have a, I don't know what you call that, third shift, they have an opportunity to go in the morning to, to lodge. And I think compassion is, is, is part of the whole spirit of putting together a lodge like this. And I remember brothers suggesting, well, maybe we can put together a group of brothers that can go out and pick up these other brothers that can't make it to lodge because of their eyesight. And I remember 
other people being very vocal about it saying it's not just that they can't see or they can't drive themselves like we meet late you know sometimes meetings extend past 9 30 at night and that's not that's not the normal schedule for some of these people so um so i i really like the idea i was very i remember being very moved by the the fact that this organization was willing to the way i thought about it then start a new club you know for people that have this specific need and meet that need in a way that they feel welcome they feel like they really belong as opposed to having to burden someone else to help them like no this is their lodge now so that's the key experience. oh go ahead sorry no no go ahead. so you keyed on keyed in on something uh really interesting there regarding like time management and how long some some lodge functions and go can go and this, this actually jogged my memory that diversity lodge number 330 which is a prince prince hall lodge that uh my lodge is is really close to um they meet on saturdays at noon uh generally speaking and so generally speaking prince hall meetings go for hours and hours and hours especially if they're doing degree work and there have been a number of times where I've, I've had brethren who have come back from visiting like a Prince Hall Lodge that has met in the evening conferring like an EA degree. And the guys are like, we didn't get out of there until after midnight. Wow. Um, but when, you, when you're a part of a lodge that meets during the day on the weekends, you have a little bit, of more, a little bit more time to play with, especially for those brethren who, who have to get up early the next day either go to work or have church obligations, et cetera. Yeah. And you know, that uh, one thing we've mentioned before is that we have a lot of things that we compete against. You have other civic activities, family, work, and all of that. And one thing that I personally hate is splitting my day in half uh, or, you know, committing to something that is going to actually uh, interfere with the time that I spend with my family. And I have join other organizations that meet Saturday mornings. And that has very little impact on, on my family because I can go out early in the morning, you know, maybe pick up breakfast extra early and, you know, leave them with breakfast and go have my meeting. And then I come back home and we have a full day ahead of us. Uh, and we don't have to cut any of our activities short to be a part of uh, a Masonic activity. So I can see the even the appeal that it could have for people, even those who have a regular schedule, but perhaps want something that interferes less with their work and their family. Okay, Robert, how about Illinois? How are things over there? So we've had a few daylight lodges um, in and around the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's one I know of that's probably a, uh, it's more in the Chicagoland area. I wanted to say it was Riverside Lodge, but as I was looking for Riverside Lodge here, um, I don't think that's the one, actually. Um, we also had one of our uh, Masonic Lodges here in my own district. AOFA 676 was uh, a lodge that used to have, um, according to the bylaws, so some of our lodges have two stated meetings a month, right? They would do like the first and second Mondays or first and fourth Mondays or whatever it was. This particular lodge was um, the third Monday and first Saturday, I think it was, of every month. And the Saturday, <clears throat> it would open up at 9 a.m. They would do breakfast and open lodge uh, at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. And I thought that it was interesting, but it went away after a while when they did a bylaw change. They just found that most guys are going to be home with their families on Saturdays and, and do that. Um, so they got rid of it. Uh, I find the Daylight Lodge concept interesting, <clears throat> um, but I don't necessarily know that uh, you're going to find, like they're not going to be as bustling or whatever as maybe a regular PM Lodge is going to be. Uh, as Jason alluded to, a lot of the, the Daylight Lodges that I've seen are... They really serve one purpose, which is a gathering place for guys who don't have any other time 
or whether that's because they're retired or whatever else. And they're older guys usually. So it's not as active. They're not doing as many things. Now, if you're one of those lodges out there that is doing crazy stuff, awesome, right? Like you're super active. <clears throat> that's wonderful. Uh, but just from my own experience, that's what I've seen. Uh, but I also think it is interesting and, and worth noting that <clears throat> when we say daylight lodges, um, it's when there's daylight out. And from what I've seen, like most or many lodges in the UK seem to meet, you know, like at 2 p.m. They like open at 2 or open at 3. Like they open earlier in the day. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting and just worth noting that uh, while it does start during the daytime, it can go into the nighttime, but to, that they start earlier is what I find interesting. Uh, and I would wonder what the attendance is like that, you know, during the week, if that's a thing. I mean, you're right. This all boils down to this is just another type of an affinity lodge, if you really want to call it that. Yes. Right? We, we did a whole episode on affinity lodges and how every lodge is unique, has its own character, has its own membership. And so this is a, not an innovation in masonry, but it's, it's a way to experiment with the structure that we have such that we can try different things. I would love to see the data, right? How active are they? Uh, does it serve a specific need? Right, and, and does it offer something uh, that other lodges in the area cannot? Uh, one one transition I want to do too is to share an experience where Jason Richards and I went to a a daylight lodge in our area, and so Jason we took a long lunch. <laughs> it was a long lunch, and that that was the the really cool part is that Jason and I both went to work. You know, left work with a couple of other masons that we work with, and went down the street to a daylight lodge. Jason, fill, fill us in on the rest of the story. Yeah, so we went down the street to Fort Hunt Skidmore Daylight Lodge and had a, uh, had a really, really great time with, uh, with Jim and Jason, who are two other Masons who, who work in the building with us. And um, it really was an interesting experience because Fort Hunt Skidmore meets, uh, I believe, Wednesdays around 11 o'clock. And uh, Masons go there and they get breakfast and then they have their meeting. Uh, they don't confer any degrees. Um, so it's, it's not, it's, it's a working lodge, but they don't actually confer any degrees. Um, and then after it's done, they, they have their own little festive board lunch. And when you think about it now, now most all the guys in there were, were pushing like mm -hmm. 70 uh, so it was most certainly um, one of those lodges that really catered to to those who were retired. Um, it's when you think about it, it's it's a great way to spend like half a day uh, to make sure you're getting out of the house, fellowshipping with other brethren. You get two of your meals taken care of, and uh, we we went, we visited, and had a really good time. I think that was the coolest part was that. We, you know, planning accordingly, went to work a little bit earlier and then we all kind of snuck out and had a long lunch and hung out with our brothers and then had that fellowship and then came right back to work to finish the day. And so we had, it wasn't like, you know, playing hooky or having like a girl on the side or anything like that, but it, it was a similar experience because you got to, according to my wife, masonry is a girl on the side. So it's the, yeah, it's the yeah. other woman my boyfriends as my wife would say and but again it was fun to to separate from the world for you know a little bit in the middle of the day and then get back to our usual vocations and so um while i haven't really been back there since it was a really cool experience to be able to um to have lunch with with brothers um in a, in a masonic setting yeah, in so, the Masonic Lodge, you know, we've we've have lunch with brothers all the time at work, but uh, to be able to actually go out and uh, and go to a meeting and then come back and finish out the day was just really cool. I did something secret over lunch, Robert. What have you got there? High Twelve International. Oh yeah, tell us about High Twelve. They basically are a lodge that meets over lunch. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> they have their own charity and whatnot. They're a Masonic or they're, they're a Masonic group, I should say, or a club. Um, they're styled lodges and <clears throat> they 
basically open. Sometimes there's a speaker over lunch and guys get together at noon, high 12, and then they break at 1 and they leave. So it's not AMD. It's not AMD. It's just dinner. Are they it, clandestine because it's incorporated? Gee, gee whiz. I don't know. I mean, maybe. Is there, <laughs> do they have any key <laughs> that they use as symbolism? <laughs> right. Probably just this symbol up here that's like a triangle with three steps. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Sounds glandy. <laughs> yeah. So, well, you know, interestingly enough, um, at work, we also have a Square and Compasses lunch club. So we don't actually have tiled meetings, but we get all the Masons in the building together for, for lunch every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was something that John and I started, you know, maybe a month or two after I got raised. So basically, you started a high 12 club. We actually talked about should we gonna have to, you gotta start paying into the general grand or whatever. You gotta so pay. Like, okay, so wait a minute. Do we have to pay our dues to some of the entire <laughs> organization? Or do we just fly under the radar? Yeah, fly under the radar. Here's That's what not anymore. <laughs> no right. one will ever know. Okay. Uh, any last thoughts and parting comments before we go to social media? It's been fascinating. I think uh, we have a variety of reasons and foundation of the history of all these daylight lodges. Uh, so I've learned a lot tonight. With that, uh, if you have any other final thoughts, save it for final thoughts. Otherwise, we'll go to Jason Richards for social media. All right, great. Well, Brother Scott Sherman has certainly been busy on our Facebook page tonight, just giving us a list of a bunch of different daylight lodges under the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. So um, he says that Merrimack Valley Daylight Lodge and Conicomb Sunshine Lodge are mostly for retired men or men that work second shift. Um, you know, let's see. Uh, Euclid Lodge was for men in the Boston Theater District to gather as brothers. That's, that's an interesting affinity lodge. Um, I bet their degrees were amazing. Uh, started up in 1916, many of the brothers took care of the costumes and makeup uh, for the Valley of Boston Scottish Rite. And uh, Scott does go on to say that in Massachusetts, they have three active daylight lodges. Uh, one that merged out of, um, or one that merged out was Fourth Estate Lodge, the first lodge for newspapermen in the United States, now a part of St. John's Lodge. That's cool. And uh, from Brother Paul Chamberlain, past master, uh, he says that we here in the Lehigh Valley region of Pennsylvania are fortunate enough to have Lehigh Valley Day Lodge 813 as a wonderful addition to our Masonic life by having stated meetings at noon in the temple that is one floor, uh, that is on floor one and handicap accessible. Uh, it allows our older brethren the opportunity to come to lodge without having to drive at night. Uh, it's also um, been a hit with uh, shift workers and first responders. Yes, I'm, I'm fascinated we didn't have more comments on that, specifically on the Facebook page, about shift workers or you know people working odd hours, nurses and the like, because I think that would be a great opportunity to get your masonry in um, while you're you know, going through the process or going through a, you know, different careers, right, that you can't be active in your primary lodge, but it's a... It's an option. I have a, in one of the lodges in my district, uh, I had noticed that this one dude always show had shown up with uh, in uniform, gun on hip, and was an officer. Wore his apron and everything. Afterwards, he'd leave. And I, I kind of did some inquiring, right? Because I, I have some connections that way. And, uh, yeah, basically attending lodge on lunch. What? Huh. Which, like, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think that specifically, um, I think about that, and I also think about a dedication to the lodge, and I think somebody that that guy takes it seriously. Um, I wish we all took it that seriously, but that's just a side thought. So, yeah, we've also got um, Brother Anthony Walsh, who says uh, St. Cecile Lodge, number 568, 
is a Masonic Lodge in his jurisdiction that meets in the daytime on the first Tuesday of the month at Masonic Hall in New York City. As charter was granted by the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of the state of New York in 1865, and they meet the first Tuesday starting in September at 1 p.m. He actually had the honor of being the installing marshal for the officers of this lodge in 2016, and he's, go he's working toward being uh, an affiliated member with that lodge as well. Uh, it was created for actors and musicians who worked in the entertainment industry. That's different. That sounds really cool. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, right in the middle of uh, downtown Manhattan, uh, near Broadway, I, I think that's just probably meets uh, about the time where the uh, performers are uh, are having lunch before their afternoon rehearsals. Uh, I would be curious to find out. I can't remember the name of the lodge, but it was uh, Harry Houdini's lodge. And I'd be curious to find out if you're out there listening, shoot me an email if you know the that that lodge and if they are uh, AM or PM lodges. That that would be an interesting thing to find out. Like if specifically lodges that dealt or these affinity affinity lodges dealing with entertainment are typically Harry Houdini became a Mason in Saint Cecile Lodge, number five sixty eight, New York, New York. Well, thanks, Google and Jason. Thank you, Todd Creason. <laughs> of the Midnight Freemasons. Win. Nice. Wow. <clears throat> so now yeah. I get to find out if that's a daylight lodge and still in existence. It is. Oh. It was the, the lodge that I just talked about that Anthony Walsh mentioned. Literally oh. one of the same. Yes. Well, wow, look at that. I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they cool. meet the first Tuesdays of the month starting in September at 1 p.m. Sweet. I don't think Harry still attends. Or does he? If they had a seance, they might find out. If you know the right words. I'm a big Harry right. nerd. I'm sorry. Only only Steve Harrison knows for sure. I bet That's he does. true. Steve Harrison. <laughs> what a great guy. Isn't Brother Houdini buried in Oak Island? <laughs> uh, I, rumor has it, borehole something. Guarded by the Templars. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not confirmed. What else do we have, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's actually going to uh, to round out most everything except for a couple beaver memes that Donnie Dillon posted, and we're not sure why he did that. Donnie. Yeah. All right. Let's get into shameless plugs and final thoughts, starting with Mike the Intern. Mike. So, so um, you know, I would, I would love to see some Saturday Daylight Lodges, uh, I mean, in Ohio. I mean, Daylight Lodges for sure. And I'm sure there are quite a few, but a Saturday would be great for me because I work days during the week. But the one like you talked about, being able to start at breakfast and be there till lunchtime, hanging out like that, I think it'd be great. Um, and honestly, just thinking about, you know, the ability to hang out like that. Uh, Jason, could you imagine if it was like when uh, we had Dave Bacon? Uh, at your lodge and uh, oh my goodness yeah, <laughs> how how late we would have been on a you know <laughs> on that yep. had we had that opportunity especially given like the two and a half hours that we spent across the street at the pub afterward yeah um, wow <laughs> that's yeah that would be amazing yeah that's what I was thinking of when you said that about uh, um, these lodges meeting during the day and, and especially on Saturday I, and you know I'm like oh that would just be totally awesome to ha if, if everyone that was there had that kind of free time <laughs> to just keep going too. Well, there goes the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, that's my take on it. Um, I'd like to, you know, if anyone out there is listening and says, you know, that we have some in Ohio, let me know. Um, don't, like I said, the only one I could find just doing a straight up Google search was uh, the Meridian Lodge number 610 but I'm sure there's more. So if you guys just let me know, I'd, I'd appreciate it. That way I can attend some of those. Okay. Thank you, Mike, the intern. Moving over to Robert Johnson. Thoughts? Well, if you happen to meet at a Daylight Lodge, uh, there are pancake jokes that I'm sure need to be made. Like for uh, breakfast? Yeah, breakfast, pancakes, yada, yada, yada. Um, 
I mean, ultimately, uh, I would assume these lodges are exactly the same as your your PM lodges, your your regular lodges. Uh, maybe they've got some kind. I think what's what's neat about them is the caveat to the reason why they were, you know, uh, chartered, uh, like the Harry Houdini lodge that we just talked about, or as Juan spoke about a need for brothers who can't drive at night or you know, whatever the case might be. Uh, so whatever it is, cool. And if you want to, uh, if you want a daylight lodge in your area, uh, put it together and do it. Um, people think that chartering a lodge is some huge thing to do. And I mean, it, and it's something to do. I mean, it, and it takes a lot of effort, but you can do it and just follow your paperwork and, uh, start a daylight lodge. I, I mean, Mike, you're free all the time. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to put it out there. Daylight traditional <laughs> observance lodge. Make it oh, happen. Hey, there we go. There we go. I a daylight geo lodge that meets in the back room of a pub with a dirt floor for a for a trussle. Oh, floor. dude. So, <laughs> write this down right now. Yeah. yeah. Right now. And the two lodge I, officer is the, the guy who's got to sweep the floor to get rid of all the symbols you drew with a stick. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so, yeah, really cool, fascinating. Um, if you like Masonic podcasts, check out Whence Came You. Uh, I go out on 930s, uh, uh, 930 <laughs> Sunday nights. Um, we just had a great interview with uh, Johnny Royal and Robert Doan, who um, made the uh, Royal Art of Freemasonry, a movie that was literally like seven years in the making. And if you if you liked that interview, you can check out an interview that Phoenix Masonry Live did with them as well a few months back, which I didn't know about until today when I ran across it, and it was a really good interview. Uh, so check that out. And I think uh, I think I'm going to be at Camp Masonry in Toledo, Ohio next year too. So that's going to be really fun. Uh, I just started getting some details on that, and it looked like a really neat thing that they're doing out there. So if you've never heard of it, you should look it up and check it out. It is cool. I almost went this year. You 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 got to come next year then, so we can party hard. I don't. Want, I mean, Mason, read and like. Anyway, that's all I got. Uh, thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Let's move over to Juan Sepulveda. Okay. Well, I hearing all of these uh, lodges and thinking about my constraints to actually go to regular lodge, it, it sounds like a, a good alternative. You know, whenever I I'm down and, and need to refill my Masonic bucket, it would be a good idea to head over to Castleberry. Uh, it's quite a ways, but you know, it's early in the morning. So I should be able to drop the kids off at school and, and head over that way. So so it sounds good. Uh, and for brothers that perhaps, if you think that you have a lot of members of your lodge who are unable to travel or a lot of brothers that are working a late shifts like use, uh, first responders or or things like that, it might be a good idea to suggest perhaps having a, a new lodge in your jurisdiction that can accommodate to those needs. So we'd love to hear more from you. If you have any uh, examples of other reasons why a daylight lodge is important, make sure to share those in the comment sections uh, under this video. And as always, thank you for listening. And I invite you to this. I have a different plug this time. I invite you over to check out The Gentleman's Brotherhood. I'm going to start putting some some videos there. If you care about uh, fulfilling all your responsibilities as a man, you know, to your family, to your community, to your children, check out thegentlemansbrotherhood.com. And good news, The Winding Stairs episode's coming up. I know I've said it before. This time is for reals, yo. For reals. <laughs> oats, oats. Yeah. I have two... Uh, two interviews that I'm editing to, to post, but I have some, some creative things that I'm putting together. Um, kind of similar to what I did for Halloween a couple years ago. So I'm very excited to share that with you guys. 
Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Juan. Can't wait for those Halloween episodes, man. That was like, that's probably still my favorite app. I, I hope you don't take offense, but I love that one. Yeah, it was fun. It's a lot of work, but it, it, it is fun. And yeah, it was. Hear it, even a couple years later, I still, I get pumped up to do another one. So nice. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Juan. Jason Richards. All right. So really good episode. Um, I loved how we, we kind of went around in circles and then realized that daylight lodges were just another type of affinity lodge. So I, I love the playing comes together. Um, really good Masonic news uh, this week as well. Um, the uh, Hopefully the next episode of the Masonic Light podcast. So I, I got to record an episode with uh, Jason and Larry and the gang from uh from last night so talking uh it's 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 like one giant plug for tmr uh but uh, i i love the uh the stuff that the masonic Lake guys do um incredible um getting back to uh to again tonight's episode a really really interesting topic um and it just goes back to the idea that, that there's a masonic experience for everybody and um <clears throat> whether you know for anybody with any schedule and that's part of what's just so great about this fraternity and again with with masonic news i love hearing these these great stories about um masonic outreach and i think um the the more outreach that we can conduct to to some of these youth organizations um like scouts and the beavers and the girl scouts um, the, the better off I think the fraternity will be in the long run. Um, frankly, if we have more Masons involved um, with, with groups like the Beavers, I think we're going to see a future crop of Masons springing up everywhere. Very good point. Back to you, John. Thank you, Jason. Uh, let's see. In conclusion, um, I've said it before, i say it again. From an entrepreneurial experience, I really think that lodges should be free to experiment. This is just another way to experiment within the bounds of Freemasonry to see what works and what doesn't, right? There's, there was a need for them. I was looking at the list uh, that I posted on the Facebook page and most of the daylight lodges have been the most recently charter lodges. They haven't been as, as old as some of these other states. And so that, that tells you something. It tells that is a, a, a need that was brought up to the grand lodge and was, was allowed to happen. And so, um, we can only learn from trying different things while keeping, you know, our landmarks stable. So I think that's been a very fascinating thing. And one commenter also kind of added a late comment onto our Facebook page, which he found benefit uh, to daylight lodges when he was on shift work because he was working on his catechism. And so that's, that's another unintended benefit of having these daylight lodges is the fact that, if you're actually working on your proficiency, if you're actually learning the parts, it's kind of hard to do that and to work with a mentor when they're on a completely different shift as you, right? And so if there's a way, an opportunity for you to uh, gain more light and masonry uh, on your off shift, then there's a way that uh, you could, you know, we can accommodate those brothers accordingly. So very neat, neat thing I hadn't even thought of. This has been great, learned a lot. So thank you guys very, uh, very much for attending tonight. And thank you, the listener, for watching and listening. Keep searching for more light. Have a good night.